good afternoon and uh, what I was told to cover an area of microbial evolution. In fact, the, at least when evolutionary biology became very active, it was never thought that bacteria can contribute to studies in evolution. Part of the reason for this was uh, at one point, beginning of the, even in the century, beginning of 20th century, even though microbiology was a very active field, microorganisms were thought not to have even genes. So microbial genetics was an oxymoron, in a sense. But things changed very dramatically by the middle of 20th century, and this is the work done primarily by several microbiologists. And one of the motivating forces was a theoretical physicist, Max Delbrück. So this is just a general statement. Microorganisms have extremely versatile nature, so that they can adapt to any new environment. Whenever they are challenged, they can adapt. And in fact, they are one of the most successful organisms that have occupied almost all niches in this particular planet, and this is possible because of their ability to evolve. And in fact, in 1943, a plastic experiment was done as a collaboration between an Italian doctor by name Salvador Luria and the theoretical German theoretical physicist by name Max Delbu. What was this experiment? In fact, I was assuming that everyone is familiar with this experiment, but after discussing with many of the participants, it was felt that uh, since there is a very equal mixture of theoreticians and experimentalists, it may be worthwhile to actually talk a little bit about what this experiment was. And in fact, it has to do with the bacterium E. coli. Delbrück was the one who actually initiated what's called the Page School. So the idea was to use extremely primitive organisms to study life and see what happens in those organisms and they extrapolate what happens in these simple systems to more complex systems. So phages are essentially viruses, they are bacterial viruses the original name was bacteriophage, then that got abbreviated to phage, and one phage that they were working with was called T1. In fact, it's an extremely deadly virus. It can wipe out the culture of bacterium E. coli in no time. And interestingly, so if you have a plate which has T1 already spread on it, and if you inoculate bacterium into this plate, there is absolutely no growth because everything will be wiped out by the phage. But interestingly, occasionally you can see colonies coming up. And if you pick up these colonies and feed them again on a plate containing T1, they are able to grow, showing that there is mutation has occurred and this property of resistance to the phage is transmitted to the next generation. These are T1 resistant. The question is, what's the origin of this resistance? There are two possibilities. One possibility, this resistance is developed only upon exposure to T1. So the phage somehow induces this resistance. And as a result, this property is transmitted to the next generation. The other possibility is that this one resistance pre-exists. In other words, the population of bacteria have few resistant cells already present, and so the T1 has nothing to do with this development of this resistance. What the T1 is doing is essentially allowing you to select for those that are resistant. So these are the two. Here the T1 contributes to resistance. T1 has nothing to do with the resistance. These are the two models. Now the question is how do you separate them out? How do you experimentally show 
that mutation is pre-exists in the population. So if that can be shown, that is supportive of natural selection. Because natural selection clearly says that the process of generating the variation and the process of selection are completely independent of each other. So the variations are already existing there by a random process, and those variations that are best adapted are selected by a non-random process, what is generally referred to as survival of the fittest. So now, how do you differentiate between these two possibilities? And the The idea was to grow some 20 cultures inoculate a small volume of bacteria and then grow them in the absence of any selection and then you plate them on 20 different plates they all have t1 and you count the number of colonies that appear on the plates, and then do the statistical analysis of this. So if the T1 is in fact responsible for resistance, then this is what's called an adaptive scheme. So it'd be more Lamarckian in its content. So what happens is, so every cell has a certain finite probability of developing resistance. So if you put n number of cells in the every tube ultimately when they, they are grown to n, the number of mutants n given by n into alpha. So if the rate of mutation is mu, and if there are n cells plated, this would be the number of mutants that you would get. But by simple argument, if on the other hand, if mutation pre-exist any point of time, so Whereas in this case, this will happen only at the last step of plating on the T1 containing plates, but if mutations pre exist in the population, they can occur at any point of time and they'll be amplified. So it's simple to see that n will be n into mu into g. That's the fact that g coming in. I'm not going to go into how we can derive this in one very simple calculation, backward angle of calculation, some of the tutorial sessions we can have this. There will be a factor of generations, number of generations grown coming into the picture. So this is what Salvador Luria, he was the one who did this experiment. He was trying to do this experiment. And he was very frustrated in the sense, when you look at the numbers, they fluctuated very wildly. So something like 1, 0, 0, 0, 3, 76. This kind of numbers that he got. So they were quite completely widely fluctuating. So, and he was wondering what, what was going on. And in his autobiography, he says that uh, there's an interesting episode. He was frustrated and he didn't know what to make out of the whole exercise. He went to a party. Uh, they were having a ball, in fact, in the city of Indiana. And he attended this party. And there were people who were actually playing a slot machine, a gambling device. So you. I don't know whether you're familiar, all of you. You put a $1 coin, efficient coin, crank the handle. Most times nothing happens, but if you hit the jackpot, you can get $100, whatever the jackpot money would be given to you. So same principle applies here. That's why so these large numbers are the jackpot events. So based on this, he clearly came to the conclusion and the fact that this number fluctuates so badly is a reflection of the fact that this is supporting pre-existing mutation. So we, the idea was if you have if this is the way the cells divide. Mutation can occur at any point of time, whereas in the case of the adaptive situation, the Lamarckian situation, it can happen only in this, in this generation where it is plated. But now it can happen at any point of time. So if it happens rather early, then much larger proportion of the cells will have resistance. But on the other hand, if it happens much later, you'll see a smaller number of mutants. So this fluctuation that you see 
as a reflection of the fact that it is pre-existing. So this was the argument that Luria made, and he communicated to Delbruck, and they together they published this paper in 1943, and I've given the reference there. And in fact, they both went on to get the Nobel Prize. So this was considered as a clinching evidence for the existence of natural selection in the living world. So bacteria became extremely powerful as tools to study evolution. But the interesting thing is, small digression, This was established as evidence for natural selection for a very long time. But in the year 1988, this was challenged. In fact, there's a serious flaw in the experimental design of the Luria Delbruck experiment. Can anyone tell me what exactly is wrong with this experiment, the design of this experiment? Remember, these are Nobel laureates. They set into motion a whole of analysis to look at microorganisms as tools for evolution. There's a serious flaw associated with this particular design. So later on, in 1988, another very famous molecular biologist by name John Cairns published a paper in Nature, Cairns over Boyle Midler, 1988, Nature. They seriously challenged conclusions arrived at by Lurie and Delbruck. It's rather interesting because Lurie and Delbruck, the paper if you refer to, it has a very uh, unusual sort of subtitle, subheading. It says, Experiments by Salvador Luria and Theory by Max Delbruck. But when you look at the design, Keynes pointed out that the selection that they used was a deadly selection. So it's a lethal selection. P1 is a deadly phage and wipes out the bacterium less than 15 minutes. It's all that is needed to have a mount a very strong killing response. So the bacterium has hardly any time to respond to the attack by the phage. So because of the lethal nature of the selection, they design a non-lethal selection of mutation. So what they did was they took a lac minus cell and grew this in a medium, minimal medium, which has only lactose as a carbon source. So what you want is to have this lac minus reverting to lac plus. So the fact that it's lactose minus and you're plating it on a lactose containing medium, it doesn't kill the cell. Unlike the previous experiment, so it's almost, the Luria Delbruck experiment was almost like having a gun to your head and then say mutate now or die and then pull the trigger. That's all the time that it has to respond. So whereas here, the cells can hang around on the plate. So they're not killed immediately. So when the right mutation appears, then you can have colonies coming up. When you look at the statistics of this, it's exactly halfway between a Poisson distribution, which is expected if it's an adaptive mutation, and the Luria Delbruck distribution is expected from purely pre existing mutation. So the statistics showed that this was a mixture of both pre existing and new mutation. So this created a huge amount of uproar. 1988 was published in Nature. opened up a huge Pandora's box. There was a lot of correspondence. For almost a year, the correspondence section of nature was flooded with people arguing in favor and against the experiment. In fact, in the same issue of nature, Frank Stahl wrote a News and Views piece saying that the title of that piece was, there's a unicorn in the garden. So saying that bacteria can 
evolve in the direction that they want in a Tamarkian fashion, it's almost like saying that there's a unicorn in my garden. So, but it was, there were several questions raised. The question was, we created a huge amount of excitement. Microbiologists had settled down very comfortably thinking that Curie and Deadbrook conclusion was right, but now CARES has thrown up the whole issue. So what's going on really? So can they really mutate in the direction that they want? So is the change is happening, is it Lamarckian? Really? So they had to go back to the laboratory bench. One of the serious issues that came up is the fact that if bacteria mutating when they are not growing, that's very, very unusual. Usually it's believed that when cells divide, that's when mutations happen. DNA is replicating. So errors are being made while DNA is replicating. And that's how you get mutants. But if the cells have stopped growing, they are simply sitting on the plate, how can they mutate? This was the question. So several people had to go back to the laboratory desk and analyze. And then they came up with all kinds of really wonderful observations. So there are DNA polymerases, those are the enzymes that replicate DNA. And some of them are turned on only upon stress. So many times when the bacteria are not dividing and there is, you can have insult to the DNA as a result of accumulation of reactive oxygen or reactive nitrogen species. So DNA bases can be altered and then you have DNA repair process figured on. So many of the repair processes are error prone rather counterintuitive, so something that is called into repair the DNA is mutagenic by itself. So what's the point here? The idea is that in bacteria, the main source of variability is mutation. Unlike sexually reproducing organisms, recombination plays a very major role in terms of generating variation. Whereas here, mutations are the primary source of generating variations. So if you have error prone, DNA synthesis, then you can have mutations. So ultimately, the final word is that, yes, bacteria do have ability to mutate, but this mutation can be error prone. I mean, I mean the DNA replication can be error prone and you can have generate large number of variations. So as a result of this, it gives an apparent feeling of Lamarckian inheritance, which is not really the case. This resulted in a large number of people trying to work on microbial evolutionary systems. And this is just a technical description of how people approach. There are several ways in which you can grow microorganisms to do all these evolutionary experiments. So one of the pioneers of this was Barry Hall. Many of the experiments that I'm talking about, many of the things that we are doing in, in our lab at present, the kind of questions were initiated by Barry Hall, and one of his major approaches was using what's called a continuous culture method. So I think some other discussion group we had discussion, what's called a chemostat. So here you have a system for growing the cells. So they are always kept in a constant environment. Everything is replenished. Cell, as they grow and divide, they are removed from the culture. So that the number of cells always in, is constant in the, in the medium. Medium is always fresh. You are replenishing the medium. So this is not a really ideal situation, but it's a very controlled situation. So you can change things the way that you want. Flow rate can be changed, so you can manipulate the system. So the other possibility is using what's called batch cut. Here you have tubes. You grow either in a flask or a culture tube, and then you have fixed amount of medium. Then what happens? There are two ways in which you can do this experiment. One was favored by Lensky, Richard Lensky. I'm sure most of you have heard of the plastic experiments that he has done. So these are batch cultures, but 
they grow from initial phase to stationary phase, then they are transferred to a fresh medium. And then this is passage. So this is maintained. So they are constantly taken and subcultured. And the classic experiments that Lenski initiated way back, almost like 25 years ago, the advantage is that you can take this culture and freeze a small alley coat in the freezer. So after 25 years, you can go back and see at what point a particular mutant arose. So this gives you enormous amount of ability to follow the trajectory of evolution. And in fact, the third group, Roberto Coulter and his colleagues at the Harvard Medical School, had something, a batch culture. But the batch cultures are not really dilute. So they are always maintained. So you make an inoculus. You have 5 ml culture. You inoculate and keep them shaking in the shaker without doing anything. You don't add any fresh medium. You don't add anything else. Occasionally, a little bit of sterile water is added because there's evaporation and you want to maintain the culture volume. Other than that, there's no additional nutrient is added. So, and then you follow what happens to the culture. In fact, the results were really dramatic. If you have normal bacterial growth curve, All students of microbiology are aware that you have a lag phase, you have an exponential phase, you have a depth phase, I mean, stationary phase. This is the lag exponential stationary. It's called the depth phase. And this is like two days. In about two days, it's assumed that the whole culture dies, crashes. And this is only extrapolated. But when you actually do this experiment, rather fantastic. This doesn't happen like this. What happens is goes on like this. After two days, it never hits the zero point. Okay? So, and this drop from the maximum, this is about 99% of the cells die. 1% survive. So if you start with 100 million cells, we are talking about 10 raised to 6 cells. They seem to be alive indefinitely. This was phenomenal. What's going on? So the idea was that what later on turned out that this is a very dynamic phase. What you have is a series of population takeovers. So there are mutations that appear randomly, and if this mutation gives them a capability of growing in the milieu of the 99% of cells the siblings have died, they'll be releasing proteins, carbohydrates, nucleic acids, all kinds of nice things into the environment. So if you can cannibalize your dying siblings, then you can grow. And these essentially are what's happening. So earlier part of the late stationary phase, you have mutant one, two, three, or there are new kinds of mutations. But again, remember that this advantage is short-lived because when you deplete whatever sources that you're cannibalizing, then you die. Then another mutation arises, and then they take over, and the whole series of population takeovers. And he called them by a very interesting acronym called GASPing. The cells are actually GASPing, but the GAS stands for Growth Advantage in Stationary Phase. So if you have a mutation here, this guy and this guy, if you compete them, number two wins over number one because it has additional mutation. In addition to mutation one, it has one and two. So, so this is better at survival. So how do you do this experiment? You take mutant one and two, throw them separately to stationary phase, and then mix them, and then you have to mark the cultures. One has to be marked with one particular marker, and two to be marked with a separate marker. You can follow the marker, and then you can see which population takes over. And always, whenever you have the later population, this takes over and not this one. So this can go up to about 
10 days. Then everything kind of settles down. You don't see a, a distinct advantage. So this was one line of study. So in fact, Hall had started a whole series of analysis, and he had described two kinds of systems. In one case, he had described something called cryptic genes. So what are these? If you look at the bacterial genome, it's very, very compact. There's very little of non-coding DNA. You don't have very much of junk DNA because there's extreme competition. Any amount of non-productive DNA will slow down the bacterium, and then there's very, very rapid selection for growth rate. So the additional non-functional DNA becomes a big stumbling block. So the genomes are very compact. So there's very hard DNA non-coding sequence. In spite of having this tight control about what is active function and what is non-functional, many bacterial genomes all showed that they, they have what are called cryptic genes. So what are these? So these are genes that are present in the genome, but they seem to be silent. They cannot be induced. So in spite of being there, the functionality is not enjoyed by the cell because of whatever reason. It is not clear at that time. But then, this can become active. by process of mutation? This mutational process can be a single base change, or it can be genome rearrangement, like what Vidya was saying in the morning. So these can be rearrangements of DNA. In many cases, these are also brought about by transposable elements. Bacteria, it was also being discovered at that time. So transpositions can also cause many of these mutations. Okay. But this is actually quite a bit of a evolutionary puzzle because if you have genes that are apparently not functional, the mutual theory of evolution suggests that they will accumulate mutation at a steady rate and Slowly, the cryptic gene will be converted into a pseudogene and will be lost from the genome by drift or any other process. But this doesn't seem to have happened. So they seem to be holding on to the genome. So why is that? So, and how does one solve this problem? So the question is to use, find a paradigm. And the paradigm is something which was worked at by other people and the paradigm here, something that we use quite extensively in our lab, the system known as the BGL system. So the BGL stands for beta glucosides. So and originally the work was done by Sam Scheffler and his colleagues at the New York State University. They were simply studying the property of bacteria, different classes of bacteria, to use different carbon sources. So Scheffler's group had identified for beta glucosides, aromatic. Many of them are aromatic in nature. So you have a benzene ring like structure. This benzene ring like structure is connected to a molecule of glucose by beta 1 4 linkage. And many of them are plant products. So Scheffler's group simply asked how many of the bacteria species can handle these substances because they are present in the soil environment. Shed, I mean, they are plant products, so when the plants shed their leaves and decaying plants accumulate in the soil, you have beta glucosides present in the soil. And the question is, can bacteria use this? So when you take E. coli or Shigella or Salmonella or any of these enterobacteria species, isolated from the gut environment, and played them on 
media containing beta glucosides, and the response is that they cannot utilize the carbon source. So what is done generally is you have something called McConkie medium. The McConkie medium has peptone, so all bacteria can grow in this. And also it has the beta glucoside, either thylacine or arbutin or esculin or cellobios, any of the beta glucosides you want to put in there. So all bacteria will grow because there's peptone. But if the bacterium that's plated can also utilize thylacine or arbutin, they will continue to grow even after all the peptone has been exhausted. And when this happens, they produce acid. And when acid is produced as a pH indicator, it will turn red. So if you look at a colony sideways, if this is a colony growing on the peptone, they can also utilize silicin. They will outgrow the original colony. And not only that, the original colony will be white, and the new colony will be red because it will produce acid as a result of the hydrolysis. And so these are called papillae, and these are really wonderful because every papillus that you find is produced by one mutant. So a colony can have multiple papillae. You can even do a fluctuation test by counting the number of papillae on each colony. So on a plate, you can do a fluctuation test. You don't need to have culture tubes. So when you do that, the reference group showed that there is a system of genes known as a BGL operon at a particular location on the chromosome. So these genes are there. So primarily there are two major functions. One function is necessary for transporting this beta glucoside from the outside to the inside. And in the process, this is also phosphorylated. So this is something called phosphotransferase system present in bacteria. And in fact, it's a very elegant mechanism. So there are several common proteins, and the molecule of phosphoene or pyruvate is involved. And the phosphate is taken from PET and ultimately given to the sugar in the process of transportation. So when the sugar comes inside, it becomes thylacin 6 phosphate or arbutin phosphate. And then the enzyme that is necessary for cleaving it, or phosphobeta glucosidase, that enzyme cleaves the phospholactylic bond and releases glucose 6-phosphate, and the aromatic part is thrown out by the bacteria. And the glucose 6-phosphate can be used by the system, by the cell, for all metabolic activity. When this happens, then the question is, why is this silent? So a lot of scope for molecular biology. This was part of the problem that I inherited from my graduate student days. It was an unfinished problem. So when I started my lab in I see, I started working on this problem. Along with my colleagues, we could get a lot of insights. Our lab, also other labs, showed that there are interesting structures upstream of the promoter. This is called a decent promoter, but the promoter is kept silent because of negative elements. So there are structural elements here. And then there's another protein called HNL. This is called histone-like nucleoid structuring protein. It's a non-specific repressor of several genes. And it's now known that HNS represses all horizontally acquired genes in the genome of the bacterium. So you have HNS shutting down the system, and you have region of dyad symmetry shutting down the system. So if this negative element somehow can be alleviated, the system can be turned on. So it can be turned on by various means. You can have a point, single point mutation in this cap locus which makes it a better capsize. So the cyclic AMP CRP protein, cyclic AMP complex can initiate transcription much better. If you can knock out HNS gene, you can enhance transcription. If you knock down the structure, you can enhance transcription. So if you get all these negative elements, you can have transcription, and the system will become VGL plus. So the wild type is VGL minus, and Mutant now becomes BGL plus. So clearly, so you have a cryptic system, and activation of the cryptic system gives you metabolic capability of growing on thylacine and arbutin if they are the sole carbon sources that are present in the environment. But the question is the weird thing: why is this weird regulation? So if the system is useful to the cell, why is it shut off in the gut isolate? And later on, in our lab, we showed that the silent system is seen only in the gut isolate. 
But if you look at soil isolates of same gram-negative bacteria, many of them have the system turned off. So it has something to do with the niche. We still don't know why it is shut off in the gut environment. We tried very hard. So one of the models was to show that if you can have negative fitness by having the system on in the gut environment, then that is counterproductive. But there is no experimental evidence so far. We have tried very hard to look for that evidence. It is still elusive. So we still don't know why it's shut off. But clearly, it's turned on in the soil environment. I'll skip this. In fact, this system is a very complex system. So the sirens promoter is only one aspect of the regulation. Once the promoter is activated, there's a second level of regulation which involves. This is a two component system making use of both BGLG gene and the F gene. So this is in fact an RNA binding protein and this can go and cause what's called anti-termination transcription. So it's an RNA binding protein that has a cognitive DNA, I mean RNA binding domain, it binds there and there's a negative interaction between these two particular proteins. So there's a kind of two component regulatory system coming in the picture. So, so now the question is, since Holder's paper that came out in 1993 about the growth advantage in stationary phase, I was always at the hunch that the BGL system has something to do with the stationary phase. And so I did a three month sabbatical in his lab, and it turned out to be correct. In fact, there are two things. So if you take cultures, 28 day old cultures of E. coli, they had already nicely frozen away random samples of 28 day old cultures of E. coli. I screened them. So out of 150 random isolates, I could find five of them which the BGL operon was turned on. So which means that the BGL plus state to be favored in late stationary. And my student, Ranjana Madan, who also worked with the cultures, showed that even if you don't have a mutation, if you grow the bacteria to stationary phase and compare the expression levels of the BGL operon in the exponential phase and the stationary phase, there's an enhanced expression. By an unknown mechanism, in the stationary phase, you have an increase in the transcription of the BGL loop. Now you can actually show that if you take a BGL plus, BGL minus bacterium and mark them appropriately and do a competition experiment, so you grow them independently to stationary phase, they have stopped growing, then you inoculate them in a competition culture. So you have a multiple inoculum. So you have A and B, both of them are there. And these studies show that even if you inoculate them at almost three to four orders of magnitude lower concentration, they catch up. So the wild type drops, and the within like six days, mutant culture catches up with the declining population of the wild type culture. But what's going on? So what? How does the activation of the BGN operon run for a gas phenotype? And in fact, a postdoc in the lab. These are all descriptive aspects of the data. You can ignore them. Just want to take home the message. Take home message is that. Certain proteins are overexpressed in the BGL plus state in the stationary phase specifically, as opposed to the, the exponential phase. One of them is called OPPA. In fact, this is a gene coding for a, a transporter of peptides, oligopeptide transporter. So it's nice to have this overexpressed in the stationary phase because you have all around the cells that are growing, dead cells that are releasing that large number of dead proteins, so they can be cleaved by proteases and you can generate oligopeptides and if they can be taken up, then the cell has a, an advantage. So, but how does this work? This works by a complicated mechanism which involves the BGLG gene product, which I told you that it's an RNA binding protein. So in this case, it goes and binds to a regulatory RNA called GCVA and this GCVA is a negative regulator of OPPA. So if GCVA is compromised, that's what this experiment is showing. So in the BGL plus cell, it decays off much much faster. So it decays are much faster. As a result, you have enhanced expression of OPPA, and that's what's causing the growth advantage. Now, more recently, about a few, three, four years ago, another student of mine made a, another rather interesting observation. The observation is that you have 
a BGL plus bacterium that's actively breaking down beta glucosides, aromatic beta glucosides. They are, this particular process is providing protection from predators. And how does this work? It works because the You look at this molecule, this aromatic part, is, nobody cared about them. They are thrown out by the cell. You can actually see in some cases, in the case of arbutin, it's a blackish brown compound. So all around the colony, you can see it diffusing out into the medium. It comes out of, since it's non-polar, it comes out through the membranes and then goes into the medium. So Robert in the lab asked the question, can this somehow inhibit predators of bacteria? because this structure is somewhat similar to some pesticide? And the answer seems to be yes. So if you take dictyostidium, this was uh, done in collaboration with Vidya's lab. So just Vidya was next door at that time and this thing was going on. So we could go and get any amount of amoeba from his lab. And Robert and along with uh, Priti in the lab showed that any bacterium that is actually breaking down actively the beta glucosides, then the plaque formation is not possible. So it's possible at all other conditions. When salicin and this is the Shigella strain, which is BGL plus, this is the axonic strain of the amoeba, 35 millimolar salicin, then they are not able to grow. So the dictyostidium is not able to grow in this bacteria and form plaque. Same thing with two natural isolates. These are isolates from the soil, MS201 and SSPA, these are both sal plus. So Robert in the process also showed that bacteria that are isolated from the soil environment predominantly are BGL plus. So they, do, they are not cryptic in that case. The cryptic system is seen only in the gut isolates. And even more dramatically, you can take C. elegans, the nematode, soil nematode, and if you use bacteria Along with, if you grow with glucose, nothing happens. 50A is the bacterial strain, soil isolate, glucose, nothing happens. So this is percentage of dead bomb. And this is AK1, which is a sal, it's a BGL minus bacterium. This is a BGL plus bacterium with salicin. The death is of the worm is very high, quite high. Showing that bacteria that's actually producing the aromatic side chain compound it can kill the, like, the predator. So this is a pure salicinin, which is a compound. And even without bacteria or anything, when you apply salicinin, the same thing happens. The cells die, the nematodes die. And this is even more interesting experiment. So this is an experiment of the behavior of the nematode. So the compound that is released is actually a chemoattractant. So not only that the bacteria can kill them, they produce them, those compounds attract the predators and then the predators die, and the bacteria cannot grow on the dying predator. So this is a tremendous amount of advantage. So summary so far, the active VGL operon confers a substantial fitness advantage in two ways, three different ways. One, it provides ability to grow on beta glucosides, that's one. The stationary phase, the beta glucoside growth, turns on many other systems that confer a growth advantage. And in the soil environment, it has additional advantage of preventing predators that come in the soil environment. So, but the question so far is, why is it cryptic in the gut isolate? We don't know this. So how does this happen? We think that this is a switching mechanism happening at the population level. So somehow, when the environment changes from the soil to the gut, the system gets turned off by a process of population control. So, we don't think that it's a single cell that is involved in this. So even in a gut environment, and even in the soil environment, there may be some wild type forms that take over the population in the gut environment and vice versa. So the switching we believe happens. The transition between the soil and the active state is likely to be dictated by the oscillation between the soil and the gut environment regulated at the population. So this is a conclusion. But not completely, we don't have all the evidence, pieces of evidence lined up. So now the question is, 
interesting. So there are uh, other cryptic genetic systems. So if the BGS system is compromised, what will happen? The bacterium. So if you do that, so take a bacterium which has BGLB mutation. So this is a phosphobeta glucosidase gene. You make that, mutate that, and ask for the cell to grow on salicin. Something interesting happens. So you have another cryptic genetic system known as the ASC operon. And it has also got a beta glucosidase gene, also beta glucosidase gene, but this system is also silent. And the, it has got one more disadvantage transport function is also defective. So you have no transport and the promoter is silent. So somehow, if you activate the promoter, you have a BGL operon turned on, so the BGLB function compromised. Now the two systems, ASCB and the BGLB, can collaborate and then give you BGL plus phenotype. And the interesting thing is, if you now take a close cousin of E. coli, Shigella soni, many people believe that it's not even a different bacterium. It's actually E. coli under disguise, because the sequence has substantial similarity between these two organisms. There's a difference in terms of the way the Shigella soni responds. So instead of turning on the ASC operon, there's another thing, SSO 1595. This gets turned on. And this gets turned on again by genome rearrangement, which involves transposable elements. So the same the same challenge that you pose to two different bacteria, the response by the two organisms are different. And this has to do with the other systems that are operation in, the, in those bacteria, particularly the transposable elements. So different bacterial strains have different sets of transposable elements, and this has an impact in terms of how they evolve. So now, a similar thing was, I think I'll stop here, and I'll probably take a break, and then if there are questions, we can continue a few minutes later. So if you were to do a fluctuation test for new mutations in this sort of system, right. would you predict a Poisson distribution? No, we still believe that what happens is natural selection. There's no evidence here to say that this is not based on natural selection. So the only question is, for some unknown reason, the thing is turned off in the cell. So when you give a selective pressure, you are essentially looking at mutations that turn on the system, and that will be showing the fluctuation. We have no. done this experiment in the lab for the salicin positive mutants, and they do fluctuation. No, I'll reword my question. I'm asking, is salicin possibly being toxic? Is it possibly also mutagenic? No, it, does, it has no toxicity on the bacterium. It's saligenin. Yes. Neither of them? Neither of them. Uh, so you said that the cryptic genes are not active, but how do you know that, like, despite these mechanisms like the inverted repeats and the HNS binding sites, how, like, how do you know that maybe there's something else that could be inducing the That's genes? exactly what we are saying then. So the cryptic gene definition was coined by Barry Horn. We, as a result of all the experiments in the lab, we do not believe that it is cryptic in the sense that it was originally described. So it is cryptic for beta glucoside utilization in the exponential phase. If you take the culture of this bacterium and ask it to grow on beta glucoside, a carbon source is not able to do that. But the same cell at the stationary phase expresses the three genes at a higher level. Okay. So as far as the growth advantage in stationary phase is concerned, what we believe is that a higher level of the BGLG is advantageous as opposed to a lower level. So the system has all already automatic mechanisms to turn on the BGLG, even though that increased expression is not giving you the ability to break down beta glucoside, it's giving you additional function. 
it depends on how you define this gene on based on which function. If you define this based on this growth advantage function, it is not cryptic. So it's cryptic only with respect to the beta glucoside utilization part. So it's only limited, it's cryptic only in a limited sense as opposed to being. So um, how this system is then uh, conserved within genome? It's like uh, it's not always active and it does not provide competitive advantage. So the, the answer to the question is that the growth advantage phenotype in the stationary phase does not depend on the active form of top. The presence of the BGLG is sufficient. If you have a delta BGLG versus BGLG wild type, the wild type does better than the delta BGLG. So it's able to produce, you don't have to have the active operon. So the conservation is because you need the presence of the genes in the functional form. So the genes cannot accumulate mutation. What's happening here is that the regulation of the gene is modified. So as you'll see, this becomes a central theme in the future experiments that I'll be describing tomorrow, that many of the mutations that are happening, evolution happens at the level of the regulatory gene that's being mutated. So the conservation is because if the structural genes are there, even low level of their transcription gives a growth advantage. So there's active selection for the maintenance of those genes. So for example, in the Shigella Sony that I was describing to you, it has almost 100% identity of the, B, the BGL gene of E. coli, except that the BGLB is knocked out. BGLB is the phosphobeta glucosidase gene. And that is, that there is a transposon sitting in the all strains of Shigella that you can examine in, the, in this world. Several diverse sources, they all show the same loss of the BGLB function. But in spite of that, the F and the B, the G genes, the regular, the regulatory genes, they are conserved. And not only that they are conserved, they are expressed at a level higher than what is seen in the E. coli cell. Which again argues for the fact that the G, BGLG, the RNA binding protein I was describing to you about, has a substantial role, other role in other networks involved in complex regulation of various functions. That's the subject of PhD thesis from one of my students will be submitting shortly. She has done a genome wide analysis of genes turned on, turned off in the presence or absence of BGLG, and the regulon, like hundreds of genes up there. There's complex interaction between BGLG and several other network players in the genome. So that's why it's conserved, not so much beta glucoside. Those are all multiple functions are performed by these. By these genes. Any other thing? So I think I'd stop here and then we'll continue tomorrow.